This video is going to be a tutorial on the easiest way that I've found to install RetroNAS, specifically on a Raspberry Pi, but I'll also give tips on other hardware as well. If you're unfamiliar with the project, please check out my introduction video so you can understand what you're getting yourself into. But if you're just ready to start and you want to build your own, stick around because we'll jump right into it. Before we begin, I just want to quickly go over who this project is for and its current state. And its current state is a new project that's still stable and fully functional. So I wanted to mention that because while the installation steps here use the command prompt and I walk you through each individual step, we will probably soon have something like a GUI installer or images or any of the other fancier ways to install it. But the only major difference is going to be the installation and the skin. It's not really going to change the functionality of it at all. So I just wanted to let everybody Everybody know that if you're an early adopter, you're not going to have to start all the way from scratch again in a few months if there's a fancy installer. You're already right there. Your ROMs are already there. Your configuration is going to be there. The only thing that would eventually change is a new skin, which should be very easy to add on. So there shouldn't be any fear at all about being an early installer for this one. And as far as who this is for, this video particularly is geared to people who want to use a Raspberry Pi or people who want to repurpose any old PC to put Linux on it. And the Raspberry Pi crowd could probably just follow this step by step without any extra computer knowledge. If you're using a PC, I think I got enough knowledge for you, but you might need to reference some general PC stuff. I leave links and I show references in the video, but I just wanted to make sure everybody knew what they were getting into. If you're a Linux expert, I would just go to Dan's videos and the wiki because you probably already know everything I'm about to show you anyway. So unless you want to be mildly entertained by an installation video, the GitHub and the wiki are probably for you. But everybody else, especially Raspberry Pi users or anybody using a small compute module like that, stay tuned because I'm going to walk you through right from the beginning. For a Raspberry Pi, or I guess any of those little computer boards, start by formatting your micro SD card any way you'd like. I use the SD Formatter tool for stuff like this. Then go to the main website of the device and download the Imager software for whatever operating system you're currently running. I'm showing Raspberry Pi software here, but it's a pretty similar process for all of those compute modules. If you're using the Pi imaging software, hit Choose OS, but do not click the main version. I mean, it's fine if you specifically want to use a different version, but I want a dedicated RetroNAS device with nothing else running on it, so I'm just going to select Other OS and pick the light option on top. Same with all other software, I suggest just installing the bare minimum with no GUI required. Then give it time to image your micro SD card. Depending on the speed of your card, it could take up to 10 minutes, but don't worry, even if you decided to use a slow old micro SD you had lying around, it won't make any speed difference after it's up and running, only during installation. If you're using a PC instead of an embedded device like the Pi, installing the OS is the same as it usually would be. Download a Linux build and use your software of choice to create a bootable USB stick or CD-ROM. Each OS should have its own instructions for this. Also, if you're using a PC, I strongly recommend just getting the cheapest SSD you could find. You could just use whatever drive's already in there, but SSDs are so cheap and so much more reliable in the long run that it's probably worth it. Regardless of what hardware you choose, you should now connect a monitor and keyboard, plus make sure you're plugged into the network via a cable, as wireless is not a good option for a NAS. You'll soon never need to connect a keyboard or monitor again, but you do need it for setup. If you're using a Pi, just power it on and let it go through its installation process for a few moments. If you're using an older micro SD card, it'll take longer, but just wait till it's finished. If it seems hung at any point and stuck on one random line, just hit enter. It's probably done and just stuck. Now log in as the default account of Pi with the password of Raspberry. There's a few things we'll need to set up here. First, change the root password with a command sudo password root. Whatever you choose, make sure you remember the password, as we'll use it a lot. Next, run the config app by typing sudo raspi config. Then go to system options, host name, and change the name to RetroNAS. 
When it's done, go to Interface Options and enable SSH. After it's done, hit OK, go to Finish, and Reboot. Now, once it finishes booting again, log into the Pi as root using the password you just set before. So it doesn't matter if you're using a Raspberry Pi, one of those other compute modules, or maybe a PC you've had laying around for a long time that you built a million years ago that you want to repurpose as a server. The only real prerequisites are Linux installed, root password support, and SSH installed, and get to a command line. So even if none of the stuff I just talked about applies to you, make sure you have a computer with Linux on it, be at the command line logged in as root, SSH should probably be installed anyway, and now we're all at the exact same place. So from this moment on, regardless of the hardware you used, everything should be identical for every RetroNAS user. So let's keep going. Okay, regardless of what solution you choose, we should now all be at the same exact place. Logged into the command line as root with a device named RetroNAS and SSH installed. I'll continue showing examples on the Pi, but it should be the same on any Linux-based solution. So now, just follow the instructions on the RetroNAS wiki to get it installed. All I did was type it out exactly as I saw, then let it do its thing. Don't worry if you don't understand what all of this means, just follow the steps and it should all just work. Also, how long this takes will totally depend on the speed of your drive. In testing, I had this take less than a minute on a brand new speedy micro SD card, but I also had to take over 10 minutes when I used some ancient card that I probably should have thrown out years ago. It's probably best just to buy the newest, cheapest micro SD card or any cheap SSD if you're using a PC. After it's all installed, type the final command to launch RetroNAS. Start it in the normal mode number one, go to install things, and install cockpit. Cockpit will take a while to load, so just be patient. After that's done, exit RetroNAS back to the command prompt. Then type IPADDR to get your IP address and write this down. You'll need it for the rest of the setup process and one or two times when you're setting up your devices. Now, from this point on, you'll never need your monitor or keyboard again while working on RetroNAS. Everything else is done through a web browser or a terminal window or both, depending on what you like to do. So you could just unplug your keyboard and monitor, and now is the time to plug in your hard drive. If you're using a PC tower, you could just plug in your SATA-based hard drive now. Or if you're using something USB-based, now's the time to plug it in. I have a neat little setup here where I took a Raspberry Pi 4 and double-sided taped it to the side of a USB 3.0 hard drive hard drive, and the only thing coming out of the back of this is a power for each device and a network cable going into my router. So I have this nice little compact device all tucked away sitting right next to my router, and I'll never have to connect anything to it physically again. All of the rest of the setup and configuration is right through any PC that you could access. So now we'll continue on from there. In order to configure the drive and RetroNAS, start by logging into Cockpit by opening a browser and typing the IP address of your RetroNAS with colon 9090 at the end. In the future, you could just type RetroSMB inside the address bar instead of the IP, but before you have it all set up, you'll need the full IP address. Also, just ignore that security error. It's only doing that because it's a local network device. You should then log in with root permissions, the same password that you set at the beginning. Okay, before we go any further, warning. This is the only dangerous part of the setup because it involves erasing a hard drive. And there's two things to worry about. First, make sure you erase the correct drive. I'll show all the info you need about that in a second. But also, the drive that you're using for storage needs to be completely erased. So if it's brand new or if you don't care what's on there, it doesn't matter, you could just proceed. But if you have all of your ROMs or data on there that you planned on using for RetroNAS, you're gonna need to copy those over to something else and then copy it back when you're done. I realize this is a pain, and while there might be more expert ways to try and import this stuff, that's by far the best way to do it. And the good news is, once you have the drive all configured, if you ever change your RetroNAS hardware in any way, you could just use the same drive, including just taking the drive out and putting it inside a Linux-based PC. So it's a necessary step. It might be a pain for some people, but let me walk you through exactly what you need. Go to Storage on the left and look at what's connected. You need to determine which is your storage drive, and it should be pretty obvious as it'll be much larger than whatever micro SD card you used. Even the small SSD I'm using here in testing definitely stands out. 
Click on it, then select the menu to the right and delete it. After the drive is wiped, create a partition table. I'm just using GPT. If you're using a big drive, like a 10 to 18 terabyte drive, this might take a moment. Just let it do its thing and refresh the page after a few minutes if it doesn't automatically do it like shown here. Then create a partition and I'm using ext4 just cause that's what Dan used. Make sure to create a mount point and I'm following Dan's advice and using forward slash storage. Lastly, I've occasionally run into an error where it won't let you use the full drive. And if that happens, just switch to the megabyte view and back it off a hair. You'll only be sacrificing a few megs of space, so nothing important is lost. Then just hit create partition and wait till it's done. Okay, now at this point, you need to connect to RetroNAS using the terminal. I'm gonna keep showing cockpit and using the browser, but if you'd like, you could use SSH or any other power user type of thing if you wanna log in that way. Once you're in the terminal, just copy the code from GitHub to launch the software and then hit one to access the normal user interface. Before you do anything else, you'll wanna point RetroNAS to the storage location you just created on the new drive by going to global configuration and configure RetroNAS top level directory. Then just manually type in the name you called it before, forward slash storage in this example. When that's done, go back to the main menu and enter install things. Installing Samba is pretty much a requirement, so start there and wait for it to completely finish. When it's done, press enter, go back to the main menu and global configuration. You can change the main user if you'd like, but I'm just leaving it as the default of Pi. Then change the password for both the user and Samba. I use the same password for both, but that's up to you if you determine security is important enough to switch up different passwords on this. And if you skip this password reset step, you'll have issues, so make sure to do it and write down the password. Lastly, install whatever other services you need. I showed Mr. and PS2 earlier, but there's so much here. Definitely take the time to go over Dan's other videos and take special note if you're a retro PC user. Heck, even if you use retro PC cores on the Mr., these options still apply to you. After you're done installing, just close the web browser. You should be completely done with installation and won't need to ever access it again unless you need to install new services or there's an important update released. So now RetroNAS is installed and configured as well as the storage drive and some of its basic services. Now you'll need to copy your ROMs over and I think you're gonna love how easy this is. In almost any cases, simply opening a file browser and typing retro SMB is all you'll need to access it. The first time you connect on each PC, you'll need to click on the retro NAS directory first, not any of the shortcuts. Then enter the username and password when prompted and if you save the password, you'll never need to enter it again on that PC. Under the main RetroNAS folder is a ROMs directory, which has pretty much every console and computer out there. But Dan made this process so much easier for people to manage. Check this out. Let's go back to the main Retro SMB share and click on Mr. You'll see the file structure is exactly like the Mr's games directory on its micro SD card. So let's copy some TurboGrafx games over. Pretty simple overall, right? But what about other platforms that access TG16 games? I'll show you. Let's go back to the main share once again, then click on the retro NAS, then ROMs directory. Now we could manually access the console and you'll see the TurboGrafx-16 ROMs right there. This is because the links created in the root of the share are sim links. The important thing to know is whatever device you connect will think it's the original directory, but you're not making multiple copies of your games. The links take care of everything for you. I'll probably have a video just on Simlink soon for more info, but this is a huge time saver that ensures compatibility with any custom file structure. The only other thing to note is you might run into a situation where you can't just type in retro SMB to access your files, you'll need the IP address. If that's the case, you can either log into RetroNAS to get it, log into your router, or run some free scanning software. You might want to familiarize yourself with this anyway, as some devices like the PS2 require the IP address, and sometimes after a power failure, your devices will get a new address and you'll have to look it up again. I'm showing free scanning software here, but as long as you're not using a router assigned to you by your ISP, just logging into that and checking its connections should be the easiest option. Just Google your model router for instructions. 
So now you have the core functionality of RetroNAS set up, which is the purpose of this video, just getting people started who want to start looking into its features and seeing what else it could do. And to be honest, if you only ever use it as a ROM host for your different platforms like Mr. and PlayStation, it's still awesome just as is, but I strongly recommend checking out Dan's documentation and videos because I think there's a lot more features that retro PC and retro console users will take advantage of. I'm definitely going to be doing a lot more coverage on it, whether it's written guides, videos, or both. And I know Dan's going to keep going with the project as long as he can. So now that you've got it installed, and now that you're one of the first people to check it out, you could be one of the testers and people who add and help maybe even contribute to new features. But either way, hopefully I've done a good job getting you started and now you could have at it and start messing around. Before I go, I just want to thank everybody that supports on all platforms and in any way possible, especially people who support on Floatplane and Patreon or Ko-Fi, because it's those services that are keeping all of this behind the scenes research, projects, videos, and website going. So thank you all very much, and I'll see you all very soon with a ton more RetroNAS content.